Loa Traxler. I'm the Associate Deputy Director here at the Penn Museum. Welcome this evening on this lovely day. It is my genuine pleasure this evening to introduce a good friend and colleague of mine, uh, Ricardo Agurcia Pascal. is the Executive Director of the Copan Association and is also a consulting scholar with the Penn Museum and happily is here in residence with us for much of this year. Ricardo is a graduate of the anthropology programs at Duke and Tulane Universities, and he is a most prominent figure in the archaeology of Central America, not only because he's almost two meters tall, but because he has truly championed the cultural heritage of um, not only Honduras, but all of the Maya area for many years. Since 1978, Ricardo has carried out archaeological research at the ancient Maya site of Copan and played a central role both in its investigation as well as in the governmental administration and protection of the site. During the 1980s and again in 2005 and 6, Ricardo served as the director of the Honduran Institute of Anthropology and History, the main government agency that is in fact responsible for all the sites and museums uh, within his native country. As director of the Copan Association, which is a nonprofit organization promoting research and protection of Honduras' patrimony, he's championed both its cultural and its natural heritage. And their important work includes very recent successful projects to reintroduce the Scarlet Macaw to the Honduran countryside, the Scarlet Macaw, of course, being the national bird of Honduras. This evening, Ricardo will present some of his research beneath the Acropolis at the site of Copan. His discoveries include two remarkably well-preserved buildings within the Acropolis. These represent uh, the two most complete examples of early classic architecture and art preserved on site. Beneath these two buildings were found elaborate offerings and magnificent royal burial chambers, many objects from which are highlighted in our exhibition, Maya 2012, North of Time, which I hope you have all had an opportunity to visit or will come again. So please, uh, without further ado, welcome my good friend, Ricardo Abursi. Central Honduras area, 
over there, and extensive commerce and exchange with the Pacific as well as the Atlantic coast and the uh, central lowlands of, of Honduras. It's located in um, a small river valley along the banks of the Copan River. And of course, we know it's, uh, we're talking about this part of the Americas, and Central America, or Mexico and Central America. Now you can see in this reconstruction by National Geographic uh, that it sits in a narrow river valley uh, right on the banks of the uh, Copan River. This is the, the main route, the center of the downtown of, of ancient uh, Copan. And it's, uh, the location is really fabulous. This is one of the higher lying Maya sites. We're up about 600 meters above sea level. So it's really got some of the nicest weather and climate in the entire Maya area which is one of the reasons I think we've had so many fabulous researchers come to work with us. <laughs> and um, it tends to be cool, and, and much cooler than most of the lowland uh, Maya sites. Now, the main group is composed of two major architectural elements. The Great Plaza area, which is all of the northern sector of the main group, and then the Acropolis, which conforms the southern end of the main group. And we're going to be focusing today, obviously, mostly on the, uh, the Acropolis itself. And one of the things that's made the Copan stand out in the entire Maya area is its sculpture. And uh, it, you know, in a profuse relief that was brought into it, the, the low relief that uh, was exalted especially by uh, the 13th ruler shown over here, uh, really makes it stand ahead of all other Maya sites. One of the things that most people don't realize is that it isn't the site you see large monolithic sculptures, the Castillo in particular, but as um, art historian Barbara Fash has pointed out, uh, more of the sculpture for Kupan was found in the form of mosaic sculpture, like the one we have on the right, where you have a series of smaller blocks. Basically. So it's separate blocks that are carved uh, and, uh, and placed on face of buildings. So we have more sculpture from the faces, the external facades of buildings at Copan than we do in the form of monolithic sculpture. The thing is you can't see it because most of it's collapsed and is in sculpture files, which we have now um, carted away in huge amounts to our research center for our storage. And um, here's another one of these beautiful mosaic uh, sculpture pieces that were put into the walls of uh, many buildings, uh, especially now, the Great Plaza, of course, is big, broad, open spaces. This is the big public space of ancient Copan. This is where uh, thousands of people could gather, probably most of the adult population of the, of the ancient city, uh, for, for major ceremonial occasions or even probably marketplace. And uh, in contrast to that, we have the Acropolis, which rises back here. Uh, it's all from plaza level all the way to the top. So the, the Great Plaza was much more private and restricted. You've seen this reconstructed uh, painting by Tatiana Proskuryakov, uh, where we have the Acropolis rising above the level of the plaza. Restricted space of these large terraces really uh, limited the access uh, of people to the uh, upper parts of the Acropolis. And it was, uh, in many ways, I guess, like the, the palace of the king uh, and uh, the place where most of the government and major religion uh, took place within the ancient city. And again, we're going to be focusing on the Acropolis uh, today. Now, the work that I'm going to be talking about is, is actually the result of a major cooperative effort, multi-institutional uh, and multi-dimensional, multi-specialist, uh, that was uh, originally organized and put together by Bill Fash, who was then at the Northern University. We really invited the rest of us to join this team. Um, especially, uh, well, three of his co directors are here. We're missing Will Andrews from Tulane. And of course, we have Bob Scherer from, from Penn, uh, Rudy Nadu Villalta from, from Guatemala, and myself. And <coughs> excuse me. on the uh, upper left, we have a number of the other outstanding members of our research team over the years is from 1988 to 1997 was the main heyday of this project. That include Loa, back here, Marcello Canuto, Ellen Bell, 
all of them uh, in Penn and who have gone on to start their own guys graduate students and now um, all of them become uh, major archaeologists on their own merit. We have David Stewart back here. Barbara Bash, who has uh, been our uh, very steady and important motor in promoting the indigenous project running. And then Cassandra Bell and uh, Molly here. And, and Joanne is over here. This is, she's not taking the picture. She's not supposed to be there. But we're holding this meeting at Dumbarton Oaks in Washington. So she wanted to be a part of the picture. And so we put her in there. But this project, uh, I mean, it went full steam for 10 years. It was a huge project and uh, encompassed a large amount of major institutions and, and the work that was done. Now, Bob and uh, the Penn team was in charge of the early Acropolis. As it turns out, Bob was seen over here uh, on the archaeological cut. This is the place where the, this is the archaeological cut over here. This is the Acropolis, northeast of the Acropolis here. Uh, it's a place where the Copan River started eroding away from the Acropolis. And in 1975, Bob was invited by uh, Gordon Willey uh, to join him in doing uh, a master plan for the research at the site of the Copan. And one of the things that Bob insisted on was that uh, you know, the archaeological uh, cut be uh, analyzed and viewed and recorded entirely from one end to the other, and proposed also that a major tunneling program start building off of the, the cut in the Acropolis. And lo and behold, in, in 1988, uh, Bill Nash invited him to carry uh, this project forth. Uh, Bob at that stage was looking at a project in, in Guatemala, waiting for the approval of the project. So he kind of uh, said, OK, I'll do it, but just for Wow. So he signed on for three years, and of course, 10 years later, he was still there. Bless his heart. It was a wonderful amount of work that we did together. And Bob mostly researched the uh, lower parts of everything underneath these courts, but my focus was on Temple 16 up here. But our work really complemented each other, as we shall see. First, Bob really made a mess of these court. And you can tell by this picture, he just tore it all up. Eventually, though, we put the grass back in and everything got to looking pretty one more time. But in the process, it's just fabulous discoveries. Our work then was uh, uh, at the higher part of the uh, Acropolis, starting with the uh, excavations or re-excavations of Temple 16 uh, proper, which had originally been investigated by Alfred Mosley in the 1890s. So he re-excavated you know, uh, the building up on top and the whole west side, eventually the north side and also half of the south side of the building, recovering much of the sculpture and trying to reconstruct it as it was in its, uh, in its heyday. And that's what the, this drawing results of the summary of, of all this work and research. Especially, uh, particular interest and focus was given to recovering the sculpture that came from the external facade of this building, you can see. Some of it, especially down the central staircase here. And at the foot of um, Temple 16 is Altar Q, which is arguably the most important historical monument at the site of Copan. There was also a sculpture in the, inside the central room of the, uh, the building above. So when we look at Altar Q, uh, we see that it's actually it's a, an incredible monument because it has all of the kings of Copan displayed as one single monument. And uh, we say that the star of this whole thing, the main figure, the one that's uh, most referred to in the hieroglyphic text that's on the upper part here, is Kinichi uh, or as translated, Great Sun, New Quetzalmoqual. And on the west side of the, uh, the altar, he's portrayed here to the left of the reigning king, uh, Yachpasa, who commemorates uh, and commissions altar. So over here we have a portrait of uh, Kinicha Chukmo, and he was wearing his name on his headdress. Uh, you have a symbol for the son of Kinicha, the Yash symbol over there. And then you have a, this is the Quetzal bird with the eye of the Mekong, so it contemplates uh, the Quetzal Mekong. And he's portrayed as a, a great warrior. Now here at the exhibit uh, 10, we have uh, this uh, incense burner lid that Beneath the hieroglyphic staircase, which is also a portrait of uh, Kinichash Kukwan, one of the 
outstanding features of him is that he wears his skull around his eye. You can see it. And there in these sense, uh, tend to be identified with uh, a special kind of, of warriors, uh, almost like the ninja kind of warriors within the uh, uh, Maya uh, society. And they were called the flower or we call them uh, flower warriors. In any case, the, the next uh, sculpture pile halfway up the stairs, uh, the staircase in this area over here. It's also some fancy, and this is a, a large scale portrait of a uh, flower with a whole bunch of skulls around. And it's uh, uh, it's some fancy, would be it's called some fancy from the Aztecs, and just skull racks, usually the victims of, um, of sacrifice that took place after battle. So there is a great emphasis on the altar to uh, Kinichash Kupong. And the same occurs with the temple behind it. In essence, I feel like the, the altar and the, the, the sculpture program of the Temple 16 are talking to each other. They're very much in harmony and integrated in their message. Uh, the central figure over here, for example, is again a full portrait, a full body portrait of Kinichash Kupong, uh, the founder. And then if we go all the way to the top, this is the, the central room of the temple on the top. This is after my excavations uh, starting in 1989. And on the lower right, we have a photograph taken by Alfred Mossy after he excavated the religion in the 1890s. And included this um, um, sculpture over here and the head that went in it, and it's been re-articulated in this drawing by, by Barbara Fash. And again, it's a portrait of Kinich coming out of the maws of a creature, you know, um, centipede, uh, and he is therefore being brought back from the underworld. So on this room at the top of the uh, of Temple 16, the highest point of the Acropolis, I can imagine that the later kings, especially, well, actually there would have been only one king, uh, who built this uh, temple, which is uh, the 16th room of the Ashpasa. This would be the place where he would go to invoke the spirit of his uh, dead ancestor, of the founder of uh, the Copan dynasty. So this is where he would commune with him. Now, this is, um, you know, as we started a uh, major tunneling program, Bob started offering his court into the, uh, off of the uh, archaeological cut into the Acropolis, and I did the same on Temple uh, 16. Now, tunnel work is actually pretty nasty work, so I don't know why I'm smiling in this picture down here on the lower right. And on the upper photograph, um, well actually you can see that the height of the tunnels with respect to my height, so this is not something I enjoy very much, in the least. And then I have my two assistants with me, this is Pancho, the spider monkey, and that's uh, uh, Sam, my uh, Labrador retriever, you see. Now, Sam's job was to steal the food from my backpack, which is over here. So I tried to bring Sam along to keep him away from my lunch. So that's the kind of relationship we had during our early years of work in the Copan Acropolis. Anyway, with the tunnels, I was able to discover and unearth uh, these two very important buildings that are directly underneath Temple 16. Rosalida, which was a major focus of my work early on, and then Oropindola, which has been the focus of my uh, work in the more uh, recent years. And so we're going to look at both of these buildings now in terms, again, of their art architecture and archaeology. Uh, key elements in this uh, research were Jorge Ramos, who was my, my field uh, director uh, during the early years and worked primarily with he started as a draft man and now um, a full-fledged archaeologist. He got his PhD from the University of California at Riverside. And uh, my good friend and colleague, Juan Carlos Perez Calderon, who was from Guatemala and until very recently. And after working with me here in Oropindola in very recent years, ended up becoming vice minister of culture in uh, the neighboring country of, uh, of Guatemala. Both just fabulous. Uh, Archaeologists. It's been a privilege for me to work with the two of them. In any case, how old are these buildings? And uh, 
one of the easy answers, usually when you find a hieroglyphic step like this one, and it's got a date on it. But uh, unfortunately, the hieroglyphic step on Rosa Vila is in very bad shape. Uh, it looks like mush. You can see the drawing of it down below. Uh, originally, it was proposed that the date on it uh, was 9-6-17-3-2, the equivalent to about 571 AD. And therefore, that it had been built by Ruder X. Um, uh, very close by, as a result of Bob's work, uh, the Ante Temple was discovered, and it had also a hieroglyphic step on this drawing. And it was in much, much better condition and shape. And on it, we have the name of Ruder VIII, so it's earlier than the, what we had reconstructed for. Uh, for Rosalina, closer to 542 AD. Now, the, the relationship between Rosalina, this is a National Geographic reconstruction of the Acropolis, and uh, showing the buildings that are buried underneath. So we have Rosalina over here, directly under Temple 16. And Ante, uh, right underneath the staircase here of the, uh, of the East Court. And by tracing the floors from one to the other, we've been able to appreciate the fact that there is no doubt but that Rosalinda is contemporary and probably earlier than Ante. So that means that Rosalinda has to date to at least the 8th Ruder or uh, even earlier than that, somewhere between 532 and 551 AD. Uh, Willow de Nietzsche is the name of the 8th Ruder. So uh, now we look at the transition between Rosalida and Oropendola. And we get that again through uh, stratigraphy. And what I found in my excavations is uh, this is Rosalida up here. It sits on a small little substructure. It's called Basu. Uh, whereas Oropendola, which is very close by, sits on what's called Oro. And by looking at the floors that these were built on, it's very evident that uh, Rosalida and its uh, Asu substructure uh, was built before that of, uh, of Oropendola. So uh, clearly, Rosalina is older than Oropendola, but not very far not in time. So I, uh, I guess that probably uh, these are built between 540 and 560 AD, uh, one first and then the other one. Now, if we look at the architecture of these two buildings, uh, we'll see there are many, many uh, similarities. On the, on the left, we have the basic floor plan of Oropendola and Rosalidas on the right here. Uh, and it's almost like they were just turned, uh, the floor plan was just gyrated uh, 90 degrees from, from one to the other one. Uh, so you get uh, three long rooms in one direction, one, two, three there, and then one perpendicular to them right there and this one over here. Now, if you came up to Rosalina, you go across this broad platform and you come up the steps, and you go into the west room, and you'd have to go into the south room, then into the east room, and not until then could you enter the center room of the building. So it's, it's, a, it's a very circuitous path. It's a, you're almost like um, you know, doing a complete loop in order to be able to access the central room, the most sacred precinct of this ancient building. Uh, in the case of Oropendola, it's not as straightforward um, because there are interconnections between this room over here and the central room. But even then, the central room is a very private um, part of the building. So the floor pans are basically very similar, except you know, their axis is shifted a little bit. In terms of their, their uh, construction, both of them had at least three stories. Rosalina is in much better shape. It's much better conserved up above 90%. Oropendola is conserved in about a 60% of its entirety. But again, if you look at them in cross-section, you can see how you have the three rooms there, three rooms here, then the uh, room on the second floor. And then in the case of Rosalila, beautifully preserved uh, room in the uh, third floor. In the case of Oropendola, we found uh, in this corner over here where there had originally been uh, a third floor, but it had been completely and destroyed when later constructions went up above. So again, uh, in terms of the, the cross-section of, of the two buildings, they are, they are very similar. In terms of the construction, uh, 
interior walls and things like that. We're looking at the, the central room of uh, Ora Pindola on the left and the central room of Rosalina on the right. Both of them have small benches in the back part of the room. The stone sizes are very similar. And uh, in essence, they are built very, very much in the same fashion. And they both have plaster covering their interior walls. The walls are about the same size and length. Uh, so again, very, very similar in terms of their construction, which makes sense because they seem to be so close together in time. Now, this is a, a chart about areas in terms of sizes of the two buildings. And I know that the, 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 uh, the chart is in Spanish, but, but all the numbers are in English, so you know, it's fair. Uh, but level one, in the case of Rosalila, it's about 226 square meters. Whereas the area of the first level, in the case of Orobendola, is about 246. So they're not too far one from the other. Rosalila is a bit smaller than Orobendola. Again, many of the dimensions are very similar. We also know, and because of the ceramics and the fill, that they're both buried a long time after they're built, uh, at least uh, Hundred years, and so uh, they are both buried at a, after 650 AD, probably during the reign of Washaka Mubarakawi, the 13th ruler of Kuban. So they're in use for a very long time. They were both tremendously important uh, buildings. Now we're going to look a little bit at the the artwork on these buildings, and again we're looking at the replica of the uh, Rosalinda Temple in the Sculpture Museum, and we're going to look a little bit more closely at it. Uh, iconographic uh, composition, starting with the, these masks down below and going, building our way up to the ones higher up. And again, here we have three stories. First one, second one ends right here, and then the third one goes up about that. So the, uh, the, the, the most important uh, panels on Rosalina are those that occurred to the sides of the doorway right, you can see here the original, and down below on the right, uh, uh, as uh, we reconstructed it, on the, the um, replica sculpture museum. And both of them, uh, we have the main element is the face of the sun god right here, the Ichaha. And above his head is a bird, it has sleepy eyes, his left eye is right eye. His beak is broken, it looks like here, and a tuft of feathers over his forehead. And he's also green, you can't see the green on the right. It's a Quetzal bird. But the eyes on him are the eye, the sleepy eyes of the Ichal. So when you combine all these elements, what you get is a spelling of the name of the founder, Inicia. So like Temple 16, Rosalila is built in honor of the, uh, the founder. Here we have uh, some of the portraits of the, uh, the big portraits of the sun god uh, in the case of Rosalina. Squid eye, his nose is broken, got the jaguar markings on his cheek, etc. Beautiful portraits of the sun god. And as we go further up, we have the uh, sacred mountain with the wheats occurring. It's a central element of the second story over here. It's a little bit easier to appreciate him on the drawing with his uh, left uh, forehead and corn growing out of it. So this is the, this, the, this is the mountain. Fertility, uh, it's the place where corn is born in India. And as has been shown by many of the researchers and iconographers, iconographers that work at Kopan, many of these buildings are marked as sacred mountains. And of course, then the caves uh, in the mountains, the sacred portals into them, are the doorways into their temples down below. And this, of course, is the place where they would go to worship their ancestors. So the mountain uh, mark markings are very important to the buildings marking the sacred mountains, the revelation of the answers or access to uh, the underworld. And on the third story, we have a skull, a white skull, and it's been identified as an incense burner from which curls of smoke come down and form of snakes uh, down the sides here. And this marks uh, Rosalina as a house of smoke, and uh, basically um, as a and we'll see how the archaeology uh, agrees with this entirely. Now we're looking at, um, at 
Govindana. And it has a very different uh, style of construction. It's um, got stone mosaic sculpture built on it. And uh, the, the artwork is really very, very different. The motifs are somewhat different also. Now, the central element in the case of Oropendola uh, is, again, the wheat monster, the mountain monster. But again, he's hard to identify. Uh, but his, um, this is his right eye, and this is his left eye over here. And his mouth, again, very geometric design, but his mouth runs down here. And in the middle of his maw is a small jaguar. This is the snout. This is the jaguar's mouth, and those eyes right there, and then his little ears over there. The second story has a large bird at the center, and then jaguars again on the corners. We're looking here at the north side of the building. The uh, east and west sides, which would be around the bend here and there, uh, have at the center also very large uh, jaguar masks. Uh, and just to give you an idea of the scale, uh, this is me in front of uh, the uh, second level mask on Oropendola, um, and this is the mouth over here. So it's very difficult to see because, of course, tunnels are very restricted. We are very up close to the building. And the, one, the photograph on the lower right, this is the eye of the Wheat's monster. Where these are his uh, eyelashes coming down in front of him. So it's really very, very uh, large scale. And here we're seeing the, the jaguars. This is the, the, the one that's really in best condition on the west side of the building over here. Again, they're very difficult to distinguish, but this is the jaguar's eye right there. This is a very large feline. It doesn't have spots on it, but I kind of assume that it's the jaguar, it could be a, a puma too. And then the snout's right there, and then these are the fangs of the snout. And I'm, here I am, he's eating me, chopping my head off on the corner mask. So these are his fangs over here, so I'm sticking my head into the maw of the, one of the jaguars in the, in the corner. The jaguars, of course, are very much associated with rulership, uh, with warriors, power, uh, and um, you know, the king is usually sat Jaguar thrones, or carved out of stone, or also jaguar pelts. Uh, very often, jaguar elements are uh, used to accompany the deceased rulers in, in the tombs into the underworld. The jaguar is also associated with the sun. It's uh, oftentimes associated with the, with the nighttime sun, so the sun in the underworld. Again, references to the underworld come up uh, from that, too. So. Um, in essence, I guess uh, you could say that Obendola seems to be like the, uh, the Jaguar Mountain or uh, something like that. The program is not as explicit as that of Rosalina, but that also has to do with the, the, the method of building the, the, um, the sculpture itself. In the case of, uh, of Rosalina, we have marble plaster, and it's beautifully executed. You can see fine incised details on the plaster on the outside of the building. That's another example. Here's another example of the, of, uh, the sun god and the profile view and on uh, Rosalina. And incredible amounts of very fine details <coughs> of the building. Uh, but in the case of Orbendola, they, they are turning to the use of, of stone for building. And what you get is a very blocky, squarish um, kind of a result. So you can see that the, this is the, the jaguar snout is over here. Here's his fang. Uh, his eye is right in here. And this is his, his ear. And you can see that it's made out of you know, uh, seven or eight different blocks. It's plastered over. So there's still the use of plaster. But unlike Rosalina, when you get you know, huge slabs of plaster being used, the plaster that's used on Orobendola is, is very thin. And so most of the artwork is now composed of stone sculpture. This is the beginning of that tradition that then becomes so incredible and, and makes uh, Copan stand out in the, the Maya world. Here we're seeing now uh, this is the, the bird that's on the upper second floor. Again, it's a mosaic sculpture. It's built into the wall. But really and truly, it's his eyes over here. Uh, the construction is really now made out of stone as opposed to uh, plaster. And 
And here we can compare the, the wheat sponsors, the mountain monsters. On the left, we have Rosalina, and on the right, we have Lopendula. This is the eye of the mountain monster on Rosalina, and this is the equivalent to it uh, on Lopendula. And then here we have the maw. This is the mouth of the mountain monster. This would be down here uh, in the case of Rosalina. And then it's very geometric uh, representation of the mouth of the mountain monster in the case of Orofino. Two very distinct uh, styles of decoration. Let's look a little bit at the archaeology uh, of these two buildings. Uh, in the case of um, Rosalina, uh, found a large amount of artifacts on, on the floors uh, of the building. These are very significant. The, the most uh, important ones, and the ones we found most of, were incense burners, like this one right here. This is the lid for this incense burner. So these are contained in receptacles where you put the charcoal, and then you deposit the uh, incense inside with the burning charcoal, then you put the lid back on and then the smoke would come out of the mouth of the monster. And there, they were, uh, I think there were six of them lying on the central bench on uh, Rosalina's central room, obviously. Uh, and then there was there was another, this one here uh, we found in this area of the building. So lots of incense burners. We also found on the floors uh, and on the walls lots of evidence of burning charcoal fragments, uh, soot on the sides, side walls, and lots of charcoal marks on, on the floor. So it's very evident that there was a lot of burning going on inside of the Rosalina Temple. And then we got offerings of jade and shell, which are custom mostly as, as deposits that were sealed below floors and or were made at the time when the building was, um, was being buried. These are some more of the offerings that have come from Rosalina. Okay, and these are, this is an offering of eccentric flints that came from uh, the passageway between the west room and the south room. And these two are uh, in exhibit here at the museum right now. Uh, they're extraordinary uh, works of craftsmanship, uh, chipstone, uh, chipstone technology carried to it to its limit, uh, very brittle, and yet they carved out the spaces and you see these points that are just incredible. This area over here is just amazing how you were able to produce these zombies. And uh, what's amazing about them too is that they were deposited as a single offering and they were wrapped in cloth. And in this photograph over here, you can see some of the blue cloth that was used to wrap this bundle of nine eccentric flints that were also flint knives as part of the offering you see soon. There were also other instruments that were used for personal sacrifice. These are uh, the remains of stingray spines used in blood by the Mayan kings. And something else that I found was fabulous working with Cameron McNeil, uh, picking up uh, pollen residue from the, uh, the rooms where so that we found, he says it's actually one of the pollen photographs, that they come from this very exotic tropical flower, uh, which is very beautiful. It's a white uh, flower, very beautiful odor to it, but it only blooms very occasionally. It, it's a species that is in the process of going to extinction. It's very good. So there's obviously many of the, of the uh, evidences of, of ritual use within the, the walls of, of Rosalina. Here we have a scene from the Akshidan, and of course it's, it's a whole ritual in which the is making a blood offering and invoking his uh, dead ancestor who looks at him uh, from the uh, platter which blood was deposited on paper or on cloth and was burned and then smoke comes the dead ancestor and so they communicate. But what I found interesting is on his right hand, the king is holding a knife, not very dissimilar from uh, the ones I found inside the Rosalia. And again, the uh, uh, stingray spines used in the personal uh, blood ritual. Again, to invoke the ancestors. These practices, of course, find many parallels in contemporary Maya uh, societies. Uh, this is the Church of Santo Tomas in the highlands of Guatemala, in Castanango. And you have on the steps of the church the, uh, the charcoal being prepared, fire, you know, the fire that is then combined with incense to make the offerings inside the church. Here 
And of course, if you look closely, you notice the soot marks on the outer wall as they begin their procession into the temple. They frequently put their the incense burners on the floor, and that's what's up in there. On the inside walls of the church, of course, they're also just covered with, uh, with the soot and soot marks. Uh, this young Maya woman is about to begin her procession into the church. And something else I noticed, of course, is the use of flowers. These are uh, rose petals that are being used in the rituals. Uh, today, it's not blood that's being sprinkled, it's mostly fire water. But the rituals are in many forms still carried on today. So uh, as we continue our work on the Acropolis, I'm uh, now bringing in my work. Temple 16 ended at about here, and then from there on down was the work that was carried out by, by the PEM team led by uh, Bob Scheer, and it led to discoveries of some amazing buildings. Uh, we have Margarita down here, and we have Yenau, and at the bottom of that, of the entire sequence, we have Bob's most incredible discoveries, which seems to be the tomb of the founder, Kitty Judge Kupal. So we will look at these um, uh, quickly. So here we have a cross section again. This is Temple 16 up here. We saw the artwork out here, the veneration of uh, Ultra Q, the veneration of the founder, the same repeats in Rosalila. And then we find Margarita uh, and Hunao are also tightly associated with the founder. These are the Margarita panels and the most extraordinary artwork that they found in the Maya world. And there is an incredible replica of this in the exhibit up here. Uh, it's, people don't realize that when, because of the tunnels, uh, you're very up close. It's hard to appreciate this panel. But up here at the exhibit, you can stand back and take it on. And it's really, really beautiful. And again, it's a, it's a large emblem scale representation of the name of the founder with the Quetzal bird here on the left, the Mokal on the right, uh, and the face of the sun god coming out of the mall, or the Yashiku on top, spelling out the name of the founder, Kinich uh, Yashiku Mo. Uh, this uh, finding of was very helpful to me in understanding the panels on Rosalina because of the, uh, the traits of the birds in my art. You can see that the Quetzal bird, for example, has a short beak it has a crest of feathers over its forehead. Uh, it also has a very distinctive eye. Whereas the Quetzal bird, I mean the Macaw, sorry, has a long, curved beak, and it has that sleepy eye that we get on the, in the um, on Rosalila of the box. So in, in the case of Rosalila, you get the head of the Quetzal bird with the eye of the Macaw, the conflatum. And the same happens in the hieroglyphic writing of the name of the founder. So below Margarita, we get the Anal another incredible representation of the, the sun god. And below that, the Hunau tomb, uh, when discovered by Bob and his team, and this is the skeleton of the founder of, uh, of Copan. These are the offerings, ceramics, that are below his um, slab. This is his burial slab. It's up on pedestals. You can see it here from the side. These are the pedestals, and then these are all his ceramics underneath the slab. And many of these are in the exhibit of a boat. Not all of them. I mean, pretty bit all of them there. Just incredible works of art and artistry uh, from the fires. And it seems to be the tomb of uh, the founder. And this is um, the work of physical anthropologist Jane Weissler, uh, who allowed us to have a complete reconstruction of this first and great king of ancient Copan, King Chashkutmo. Now as we look at um, Oropendola, uh, the, there are some significant differences here too. And for the most part, the floors on the building have been swept clean. There are very few artifacts on them. The ones we did get in the forms of offerings are of the same height, generally speaking, as we find in Rosalina. Uh, they are offerings of jade and shell. Uh, in this case, it, organized in King Queen Book's form with uh, objects deposited in the cardinal directions and a very large jade bead on the shell uh, marking the, the fifth point. So you get north, south, east, west, and then the central point of the, um, the, uh, the cosmos and the universe. And that one was found right back here in the central bench of the, of the One of the big surprises from Oropendola, and it's one on which uh, 
one of um, Penn's best, uh, John Barron worked on, is uh, he's uh, scratching, he's itching, he's uh, graffiti on the floor of the second um, level of Oropendra. And they're what we call the pulley boards. The one here on the lower right is the easiest one to identify. They're game boards. And they have, here's a larger one over here, little pieces going around and then across in the middle. And uh, we found uh, over 10 of them inside scratched, uh, etched on the floor of the, the second floor of um, Oropendola. And in the case of one of them, we still found a game piece sitting on one of those squares, which is just from down here. Pretty amazing. So um, this is, um, allow us to put forth the theory that this was the very first casinos of the Americas. <laughs> And uh, there were other um, figures uh, etched into the floor. This seems to be a full, full figure representation of the corn god. You can see his face blown up over here. His nose, his mouth, his chin, his eye is right there. And he's, 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 uh, his right foot is left, but he's dancing. This is his belt over here. And his left hand is stuck on from his right hand over here. And it's uh, on top of him, and they put in a patrol board. So you know what was more important here. The gambling side of it. And then there's another figure over here with his right leg, his left leg, his belt right here, his left arm. His head is uh, not in very good shape. Now, something similar occurred in, in the second floor of uh, Rosalina. So here's another area in which the two are very similar. But here, we only had uh, two patoli boards etched into the, uh, the central room. We know from the case of uh, Rosalina more clearly than uh, Robindra that there was no access to the second floor. And even though this, this room is very small, for the most part, the second and third floors in the case of Rosalina are just like, I guess you call them voting boards, or, or, or just huge canvases on which to hang. Their, their art, they were not really functional. These were not rooms that people had access to and did anything in them, uh, for the most part. Okay, and then let's look now at uh, Orobindola as a funerary temple. This is some of my most recent work. Uh, towards the end of the 2007 season, uh, we were finishing all the, completing the registers of I'm working in that central room over here, and we were putting in an, an axial trench right down the middle to verify the existence of an earlier version of Oropendola. And in the process of doing that, we discovered the massive stone slabs uh, right in the middle of the central room. Uh, my excavations of the floor I was looking for was only like perhaps 20 centimeters below where we were, so this is completely expected and of course it was as always at the end of the season we were packing up to leave uh, all of my boy this is Juan Carlos Perez here uh, had already got, gotten a job they're moving off to work somewhere else and here we are hitting it seems to be the capstone of the major gym. So uh, I had to cancel that project and start fundraising again to try to come uh, to terms with this very great discovery in our work. So in June of 2008, I reinitiated excavations. I came in from the side expecting to find a royal turn down here. It was not as easy as I thought, but eventually we did uh, find the tomb 0801 directly underneath the central room of Oropendola, um, as you can see in this floor plan. Now, working again, excavating the tomb, and all of knows this is better uh, than any of us do. It's, it's tremendously uncomfortable and tremendously uh, difficult. And in this case, we had to use uh, these rails up here. Uh, we used to hang uh, the uh, platform, our excavation platform, down the middle of the, of the burial chamber. But in all honesty, these large rails up here were actually put there to keep those large capstones from coming down on our heads. So they had a dual purpose. And here we have uh, Joanne. Again, Bob's uh, graduate students here at Penn, who's joined us in our early stages of work. Most of the excavation was actually carried out by Molly Fear Donaldson, from uh, a graduate student from Harvard. And uh, 
she spent an inordinate amount of time lying on her belly, excavating down, as you can see on this photograph. Um, very difficult work, and she did a, a fabulous job. So this here tomb looked like once it got a lot of the rubble cleared away, because the roof had collapsed and fallen in. So it was, and most of the things in the tomb were very badly shattered as a result of that. But you can sort of see the outline of the body here. The head is in this area, the feet are down here. Again, many of the objects in the exhibit upstairs come from, uh, from this burial, from this photo too. Again, schematic, uh, just to make it a little bit easier to visualize where the body is. And again, these are all the, these are, most of these are uh, ceramic offerings. These are huge amounts of shells that were deposited at his feet. There we go. We pointed, not one too far, but I guess I tried it. Large bundles of shells here, and a little bit further down over there. So let's look at some of the offerings. These are the some of the ceramics after they were uh, restored by our team. Had huge amounts of cooperation from Lynn Grant here from the uh, Penn Museum to help us put many of these things back together. In, uh, many in a miraculous fashion. Uh, the style of ceramics dated very early in time, somewhere between 435 and 490 AD. So this is a very early royal tomb. Um, these carved uh, blackware uh, with red uh, cinnabar put in the crack zone. Uh, incredibly beautiful. There's one of them on display upstairs also. We also had some of the, uh, these um, cups um, that were plastered and painted. And when I first saw these pink colors on them, I thought this can't be true. And if I hadn't found it, I wouldn't believe that it was for real. Uh, the colors are just so bright and beautiful. We also found these uh, small miniature stone bowls. This is, this is a single piece of rock that's been carved into the shape of these two little miniature bowls. They're actually, it's the same boulder that holds them down, so the base is the same as the bowls themselves. And it was also plastered and painted, as you can see in this section over here. Unfortunately, the, the uh, plaster did not hold on very well to the, uh, the stone surface, and most of it was falling off. You can see, uh, as we found it in the process of excavation, how the entire area just have no plaster on them. Tons of other things coming from this tomb, as in most of the royal tombs. The Copan, we had a lot of pearls, shells. Uh, these are probably part of a, of a headdress, uh, or I mean, of a, a helmet that was born, worn by the king, and large pieces of jade. These are two of the most beautiful uh, jades from uh, the, this royal tomb. On the one on the left is a representation of the sun god, and it's in display upstairs. Uh, next one, we get the monkey head of how Between the two of them, we get the equivalent royal titles. Uh, they're markers of, uh, of, of kingship. Another of the uh, beautiful necklaces that we found is, is composed of, of uh, macaw heads. You see two of the larger ones in the center. Uh, they're stylized uh, profile heads of macaws, but some of them, you can see the, the enormous differences in size between some of these and some of the itsy bitsy little ones over there. And you have to remember that the, the jade is extremely hard and it's very difficult to work. So uh, it just baffled me many times how they carve, especially the smaller ones, because the bigger the object, the easier it is to work on it to carve it away, but these very, very small ones are terrible. Also, I have a set of mirrors that are stacked one on top of the other. Again, just miraculous work by, uh, by Lynn Grant. And this one is, is upstairs. She's actually been able to kind of piece together the pyrite uh, fragments that were in the middle, and there were actually this reflective surface. She also pointed out to us that the decorative motif on the outside here, this is a, a shell uh, ring uh, our series of eyes, which are pupils, inlaid. Here's one right here with a new pupil. And the eyes on one side are open, but on the other side, they're closed. And then on the right is a, another figure that's coming from the stack of mirrors. It's probably the back side of the mirror, and it has a little animal. His head is over here, his eye, his tail, right there, which is probably an armadillo. This one is also upstairs in the exhibit. 
tons of shell, like I mentioned, enormous amounts of, of shell during the shell. And in this case over here, this stack of them, very, just to the right of the head, we found this card figure over here, heads up here, eyes, nose, mouth. Um, he's nicknamed the guy with the striped pants because you can see he has two legs here and he's got stripes on him. Uh, he's also uh, on exhibit upstairs. We have no idea who this is. And some more of the offerings of Shao and Jade. Uh, these are also uh, on exhibit. In any case, after a ton of work and analysis and stuff, we, this is a, you know, a display of all 16 rulers of ancient Poban coming from all three Q. The ones in red are the ones whose tombs we believe we have found. And then the ones in green are the candidates for this tomb. So it's either the second, third, or fourth ruler. In any case, it's still one of the very early rulers of, uh, of ancient Poban. So in essence, what we've been looking at is two, um, two uh, royal funerary temples at the bottom. Each one has a major royal tomb uh, buried directly underneath the central room of each one. In the case of uh, Rosalida, we have the tomb of Kenichi Ashbifon. In the case of Orobindola, we have the burial of this very early ruler also, somewhere between the second and the fourth ruler of the bottom. And uh, anyway, we have seen how these two temples speak to, you, to us in terms of their art and their architecture and, and their archaeology. But that's not the end of it. I also found that um, Rosalina was the tallest building on the Acropolis at its time. And the winds uh, in the Hopan Valley tend to prevail in the east, which means they would have come in this general direction. And I found that on the uppermost part of the building, on the third floor, there were these two slit windows. Behind them are three small rooms, one right there, one right there, and another one over here. And I sincerely believe that during the coldest months of the year, uh, October, November, and December, when the wind would come whipping through the valley and through these holes, they would actually produce sound. And uh, Part of what I think is the proof of it, too, is this is the doorway on the third floor, but you can see that the door used to be a lot bigger. I think they closed it off to modify the sound that was produced as the wind came flying through the building. I still plan to build a replica of it someday and put wind on it to see if that results. In any case, I think that this building really actually produced sound and either howled or shrieked and all very appropriate for a very happy Halloween. <laughs> Thank you all very much. It was exposed to air for a while, it's really hardened uh, quite a bit. 
So no, and, and even on all the rooms, were also filled in. Uh, the building in the rooms, what they did is they, they ripped out the section of the, uh, the roof uh, vault and then filled it in from above too. And mostly they used, uh, it was wet laid, it was um, clay eyed soils with mostly boulders. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for being here.